Well, good morning. Welcome you to Open Door Church. We're so thankful to be able to come into this place that God might be glorified among us, that we might sing praises to Him, that we might hear instruction from His Word. And so today we've come that we might honor Him, but also that we might encourage one another. So I know you've already been an encouragement to someone this morning, and just keep that up, and God will be glorified in that. Let me read to you from the uh, 32nd Psalm. This is going to be the text for our message today, and I just want to read it to you so you can think about it before we begin, or as we begin. Psalm 32 says this, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found, surely in a flood of great waters. They shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Shall we now go before the Lord in prayer? Dear God, as we come to you, thank you, dear God, for the forgiveness that you provide for us. Thank you, dear God, that you are a merciful God, that you are one who desires to draw us to yourself in times when we are weak and draw draw us to yourself, even in times that we stray from you. So I pray, dear God, today that you would use your word to speak to our hearts, And Father, now, as we prepare ourselves, Lord, may you be glorified through our singing. Father, that we may together sing praise to your name. So, Lord, let our focus be upon you and not upon anything that might distract us, but allow us to enter into your presence in a way that glorifies you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Everybody come close, come close. All right, I have something that, I have a word I want you to read here. What is that word? Stop. What is it? Stop. What is it? Stop. Does anybody ever tell you to stop? Stop and wait. Stop and what? Stop and wait. Stop and wait. What do they tell you to stop? If you're doing something, what is it that mom says, stop? What is it? Stop playing because it's time to do something else. What else? Stop what? Stop screaming. Stop screaming. What else? Stop what? Stop shouting. Stop shouting. What else? Uh, I thought surely you would say. One more. Maybe you can guess what I'm thinking. Stop bragging. Bragging. Okay. Stop breaking your toys. Stop breaking your toys. Stop throwing your toys. How about stop fighting? Did you ever did you ever hear that? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we hear that. So the stop. Is that a word that you like to hear? If you're doing something, you don't like to hear that word stop. But you know that's a good stop. It's a good word, stop. It is. Now, I have another word. Uh, that's a stop sign. Well, let me ask you first. When your dad is driving, your mom is driving a car and they see that word, what do they do? 
they stop. Why do they stop? Why is it important that they stop? Hmm? If they're driving, why is it important that they stop where it says stop? That's right. Or maybe a car coming the other way. And so it's good to stop. And they don't just stop, but they stop and do what? Think. Stop and think. they think. They think maybe there's somebody coming the other way. They think maybe that uh, uh, there's somebody crossing the road. They look. They stop and look. That's right. So here's that other sign that we need to see. What is that there? You mentioned it. What is it? Stop and look. Stop and think. Do you know sometimes we need to hear that? We need to hear that we need to stop and think. Sometimes we forget about things that we need to be thinking about. You know, we can, every day we know that God blesses us, right? We know He blesses us. But we need to stop and think about His blessings. We need to stop doing other things so that we can think about God, so we can think about the promises of God. And so sometimes if we're real busy, and sometimes your mom and dad get so busy, they just need to stop and think about how much God loves them and all the promises of God. And so let's pray and let's thank God right now. Let's don't forget to do that. It's most important right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the children. I pray that we might be reminded always of your love and your care, your concern. I ask you that, Lord, the children might be blessed as they go to class. Bless their teachers as well. And, Lord, that we would be blessed as we open your word today, too. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Amen. If you would, open your Bibles to the book of Psalms. And we're going to be looking at the 32nd Psalm today. As we look at the series of messages that we've been sharing with you in weeks past, we know that after Israel crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land, that we see that God raised up a series of judges to lead them in His ways. Great individuals, wonderful leaders. And yet, Israel was unsatisfied they wanted to have what the other nations had. They wanted a monarchy. They wanted a king to reign over them that they might be able to celebrate their king. So God sent the prophet Samuel to select and anoint a king. And he directed Samuel to a man by the name of Saul. Now at first, Saul was overwhelmed with this. It was something that he could not have imagined. He saw himself as the least he felt totally unworthy. But eventually this idea of power went, goes to his head, and as it does so often, it changes Saul. It makes him a different man. If you read the book of 1 Samuel, you'll find the story of King Saul as it is recorded for us from beginning to end. Now Israel had what it wanted. They had a king. Or at least they had what they thought that they had wanted. Because King Saul proved himself to be unworthy. You see, he was what Israel deserved, but he was not what Israel needed. But our God is a God of grace, and our God of grace selected another man, a man of his own choosing, that he might be king over Israel, a man by the name of David. I'm not going to go into great details, but you know that he is the greatest king that Israel had ever known. This former shepherd boy was the author of about half of the book of Psalms. And in them, he expresses more consistently than any of the faithful men and women who preceded him the awareness of God and the fact that God wanted to have a vital personal relationship with us. Others had known about God. Others had taught about God. But he seemed to have it understood that God was not a God that desired from people rules and rituals. 
He understood that those things, following those things, would never make us acceptable to God. He understood that offering and sacrifice could not atone for sin. David had that relationship with God to where that he seems to have known the mind of God and he knew the will of God. As you read the Psalms, you'll find that many of David's prayers are as appropriate for Christians today as they were for the God-fearing people in the Old Testament. In fact, it could be said that David's writings show that a, that a life that is characterized by a personal knowing of God was as real in the Old Testament as it was in the New Testament for the likes of the Apostle Paul. Even though the full revelation of God in Jesus Christ was still in the future, David understood what it was to have that personal relationship with God. He took those promises of God and he based his life upon them. Now this morning I have decided not to share with you the story of David's life. I did that on Wednesday nights for about a year, and so those of you who are with us through that, I would not repeat that today. But instead, I want to share with you this psalm that was written as David reflected upon something very powerful, very wonderful in his life, that thing called forgiveness. That forgiveness that he had experienced despite a succession of grievous sins and moral failures. You read the account from David's life, especially in regard to Bathsheba, with whom he committed adultery. And then her husband, Uriah, as he placed him in a position in battle where he would certainly die. And you would likely wonder how God could ever have forgiven him for such things as that. David would have also wondered, except for the fact that he experienced the forgiveness of God in relationship to such sins as David had sinned. Beyond our reasoning, beyond our imagination, that a man could sin as he did and yet have a close walk with God, he certainly did that in a time that he had wondered from God, but we find him restored. We find him coming back. We find God forgiving him of all that he had done. What a great and glorious God we serve that He would forgive the likes of David after David had sinned so grievously. Now as we read this 32nd Psalm, it is apparent that David has come to a place of deep repentance over his great sin. Now that repentance was followed by peace that he had forgotten could be so very peaceful. Stop and think this morning. Has there been a time in your walk with the Lord where you were more at peace with God than you are today? Was there a time that it seemed like the peace of God was washing over you? And listen, because that is something that God desires for us to experience once again. Now, if Satan has been trying to get you to focus your attention on your failures, did you know he'll do that? then this psalm is for you. Before we continue, let me ask you a question. Could there be any greater sins than those sins that David committed? Can you imagine anything that would be more an offense to God than what David did? And yet he arrived in a place of deep repentance and God forgave him. Now again, let me emphasize that this repentance was followed by a type of peace that was at such a height that man has difficulty understanding it. In fact, it would be hard for anyone, no matter how eloquent they might be with speech, to be able to explain such a peace as that, the peace of knowing that you have been forgiven, that there is nothing that you could do that God cannot forgive. You see, it'd be hard to understand it, but the truth is that you can experience it. Every one of us need to think, about the forgiveness of God. Every one of us need to stop and think about the forgiveness that is available from God. Now, why is that? It is because Satan wants us to concentrate instead upon the sin that we have committed. He loves that. When you read of David's sin, pause and think, not about how great David's sin is, but think about how merciful God was 
in the fact that he was forgiven. And when Satan brings up your sin, pause and think about how merciful God was to forgive you of that sin. And when you do, you will defang that old serpent. He may rear his head back, He may cock it back that he might attack you, but the fangs are gone. He has nothing with which to bite you. He has nothing with which to attack you. If you understand the forgiveness of God, if you are living in the celebration of the forgiveness of holy God, because anything that he accuses you of that you have confessed to God, he has no reason to hold it against you. It's settled. It's done. Let me explain a bit more. After we confess our sins before a holy God, the devil wants us to continue thinking about our sins. He wants us to think about our failures. That way, what he does is he keeps you neutralized so that you cannot do anything for the glory of the Lord. So stop and think about that. I have entitled this message, The Pause that restores. And I believe we should pause every day, if at the least we should pause every day, and allow God to restore us. David has written this psalm in order to help us understand how to do that. So let's begin. Let me read it to you, the first part of this again. And notice how David says it. He says, how blessed is he, listen to it, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. David writes and says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Now there was a word in those verses that appears three times that I did not read. You'll find that word 71 times in the Psalms. You will find it three more times in the book of Habakkuk, that word, Selah. You see, that word is there not really so much that you might understand anything, add anything to the text from what it means, but instead it is a word of instruction that is placed there within the psalm. What is it instructing you to do when you see that word Selah is to pause at that point in the reading and to think about what you just read. Pause that you might have the opportunity to let what has just been said sink in. Now there is much in this psalm for you to pause and to think about. It is said that Martin Luther was once asked which of the psalms that he liked the best. He answered this way. He said, the psalms of Paul. The 32nd, 51st, 130th and 143rd, because they all teach that the forgiveness of our sins comes without the law and without works to the man who believes. Do you see what he was saying? The Psalms of Paul. It was as though Paul wrote these words. It was as though Paul said this. This is what Paul would have us to understand, that the forgiveness of sin comes without the law and without works to the man who simply believes. You see, we need to understand that. In fact, there is much here about which we need to stop and think. And so, let's look at it. The first thing I want you to do is to pause and think about the blessedness of being a child of God. Okay, are you with me? 
Pause and think about the blessedness of being a child of God. The psalm begins in this way, how blessed is. Now the word blessed is in the plural, not in the singular. It is in the plural that it might show the great joy, the multiplied joy of the one being described. Not just one blessing, not just a little bit of blessing, but great blessing. How abundantly blessed we are. Now, if that word's talking about joyfulness, if that word's about talking about something that we can rejoice in, what is it that we can be so joyful about? What does it say in verse 1? How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty happy about that. That my transgression, every time that I have rebelled against God, that that is forgiven. What does this word transgression mean? It it means rebellion against rightful authority. All of us know that God is the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. And yet, all of us have experienced those times when we ourselves have rebelled against His authority. Or we've done things our way when we knew it was contrary to what He would have us do. That is transgression. We have all transgressed. We have all gone beyond what the Lord would have us to do. But blessed is He whose transgression is forgiven. Now what about that word forgiven? What does it mean? It means to have something taken off or taken away. You see, the burden of our transgression, He says, has been lifted from us. Now listen to this. Blessedness is not here described as being toward the man who has diligently kept the law, but the man who has been the breaker of the law, who by the means of the grace of God has been forgiven. You see, no Pharisee ever enjoyed such blessedness as we've talked about here. Because they pretended they had no transgressions. They pretended that all was well, that they were holy and everything was righteous. They don't know what this is. And if you think yourself to be one who is without sin, that you will not understand this. But when you have dealt with your sin, when you have seen that you fall short of the glory of God, when you see that you have transgressed the law of God, and then you realize that God has forgiven you all of that, what joy that is. What blessing that is. Notice notice what else he adds to that. He says, whose sin is exposed for the world to see, whose sin is there in order that it might be recorded in eternity and we might have to pay for every one that we have committed. No. What does it say? Whose sin is what? Covered. Whose sin is covered. Now, what is sin? Well, you know what sin is. Sin is a missing of the mark. It is falling short of the glory of God. To have your sin covered is a wonderful blessing. And you say, I know that. That's the reason I try to cover my sin. That's the reason I try to hide my sin. That's the reason I don't want anybody to know about my sin. Well, it doesn't say who covers his sin, that that one is blessed, but it says whose sin is covered. And who is it that covers it? It is Almighty God. You see, to cover your own sin, that's not a blessing, that's a curse. In fact, in Proverbs 28, 13, it says, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. If you are hiding your sin, if you're hiding your transgressions, you're not going to be blessed of God. That person who's going to be blessed is that one who confesses to God, who agrees with God that they have fallen short of the glory of God. You see, we might try to hide our sins, by lying to ourselves about it, or by trying to justify it, or by playing the hypocrite and trying to lie to others about it. The difference between this evil covering of sin and the kind in which we can rejoice is the difference between us dealing with our sin and God dealing with our sin. How blessed you are when God has forgiven you, when He has covered your sin. That word covered was used to speak of the Ark of the Covenant that was covered by the mercy seat. You know that within the Ark of the Covenant there there were the tablets of the law, 
which would condemn us, but they were covered over. They were covered by the mercy seat. The law might condemn us. None of us are perfect. All of us have failed, but the mercy of God is ours because of the Lord Jesus Christ. This word covered could be talk about the Pharaoh and his army being covered by the waters of the Red Sea. I mean, they were covered over completely. And even so are our sins covered over completely because Jesus Christ has shed His blood in order that we might be able to be forgiven in order that we might know this blessedness. Look at verse 2. He says, How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. This word iniquity is a word for moral crookedness. This speaks of our sinful nature. It speaks of our natural leaning towards sin. You never met my grandmother. But my dad's mom was a little slight lady. And she, ever since I knew her from the time I was young and until the time the Lord took her home to glory, she had a curvature of her spine so that she walked, stooped over. I never thought anything about it. I just thought that's the way grandmas were made. That they just came that way. And that was all right. I never thought about that being anything but normal. And indeed, I never heard her complain about it. I never heard her say a word about it. It just seemed to be normal for her. But we know that condition is not normal. We know that there was something that was wrong. Well, there is something that is normal for us. Every one of us have a curvature of the soul. Of the soul. You see, we are sinners by nature. When we walk according to our human nature, we walk with spiritual, with a spiritual crookedness about us. It may even seem normal to us the way that we walk, but it is not the way God created man to be. When a person accepts Jesus as Savior and Lord, he can walk straight under the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Listen to me. Let me say to you that we do not have an excuse for sin. Do you understand that? Everybody understands that, right? Sometimes whenever we talk about grace and we talk about forgiveness, people say, were you giving people a license to sin? No, that is not the matter. We have no excuse to sin. So why do we sin? It is because all of us have a sin nature. We sin even though we have no excuse for doing so. But if you've been forgiven by God, if you have come into a relationship with holy God, you are no longer a slave to sin. There is a power within you that enables you to conquer sin. You know what that power is? His name is, He is the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in you, who gives you the power to overcome that sin. But He says here, How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Is it heresy to say that the believer sins, but his sins are not accounted to him? Is that wrong? No. It would be heresy to say anything else. Whenever we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, what happens? We have been forgiven of sin, both our past, our present, and our future sins. It is all forgiven. He doesn't impute iniquity to us. And what that means is he's not going to, once you have been freed from sin, once you've been set free by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, never again will that sin come between you and God as to your relationship. Now we are blessed because we have a substitute who stands in our place and has already paid all of our debts, all the debts, all the charges against us as regard to our iniquity. No excuse for sin. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. But even when we sin, our relationship with God is such that God does not impute that against us. He does not put us back into the slave market once again, but we have been forgiven and we stand as the children of God. And David about this time shouts, Hallelujah! Iniquity not imputed to it. He goes on to say in verse 2, And in whose spirit there is no deceit. That word deceit speaks of insincerity. It speaks of cunning. It is a word that we could substitute the word hypocrisy. In fact, I looked it up in my Portuguese Bible and that's the word that is used there. The word for 
hypocrisy, in whose spirit there is no hypocrisy, no deceit, no cunning, no insincerity. You see, we are, as believers, free from deceit. We are free from hypocrisy because we do not pretend to be something that we are not. We acknowledge readily that we in ourselves fall short of the glory of God, and yet we rejoice to know that we have already been forgiven of all of our shortcomings. All right? He establishes that, and he says how happy I am, how blessed I am, how blessed you are if you understand these things. But look at verse 3, because you see David goes on to tell us, I want you to know that sin does have an impact upon the believer. He says in verse 3, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Now think about that. I include these verses in the part of the message where I'm talking about the blessing of being a child of God because I do count it a joy to be treated as a child of God so that I am made aware of the separation that comes whenever I sin, separation from the fellowship of holy God. There is that loss in my life. There is that sense of distance that comes about in my life. I am still a child of God, but how grievous my sin is to me. You see, sin does have an effect upon a believer. What it does is it robs you of that peace and it robs you of that joy and we become miserable. God begins to squeeze us through circumstances, through people, through our own conscience and what we do is we dry up. It is difficult. That's the wrong word. It is impossible to pray to God and to praise God when you have stopped confessing your shortcomings and your sins. When you don't come before God and say, God, show me where I'm falling short. Show me, a, show me my need before you. Whenever you think all is well and you can just go on about your life and just live it the way that you're living it and yet there is sin there, there's going to be a drying up within your soul. David says this way. He says, his body wasted away. I mean, when you're so spiritually oppressed, when you are so spiritually in difficulty that you can speak, it affects you so much physically that you say your body wastes away. Now, the word here that is used for body in the New American Standard actually is the word that normally is used to speak of our bones. And when I think about that, I suppose our bones are the strongest portion of our bodies, but he's saying, all the way down to my bones, I was wasting away. You ever felt like you were hurting? It was, it was, a, it was, you were hurting all the way down to your skeleton. I mean, you, you just every ounce of you was hurting. David says he felt as though his body was beginning to decay with weakness. All of his spiritual energy was destroyed. His spiritual activity stopped as well. You might say that he knew what it was to be confined to a spiritual wheelchair where he just could not walk as he needed to walk. He certainly could not run. He was restricted spiritually. He said, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Does that sound like a person at peace? No. And when there's sin in your life, there will be that lack of peace. You see, he was silent as to confession, but he was not silent as to sorrow. And his grief became so deep that David compared it to the roaring of a wounded beast. That's that word, groaning. Now folks, those are the sentiments of a believer who has been separated from fellowship with God, who has not dealt with their sin, who is walking in sin, walking in rebellion against holy God. He says in verse 4, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. You know, picture this. How great it is to be supported by the hands of God. Right? Isn't that, a, isn't that wonderful to know that He's there? He's supporting you. He's lifting you up. What a glory that is. But what a sorrow it is when you feel like His hand is pressing down upon you. David said, 
That was the way it was for him. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this. He said, Better the world on a shoulder like Atlas than God's hand on the heart like David. Having the whole world on your shoulder, less of a burden than the hand of God on your heart. He goes on in verse 4 and he says this, My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. My vitality was drained away from me. Have you ever worked to such a point that you just could not continue? The sun is beating down on you. You are spent. You're, you're, you're dehydrated. Everything is, everything is wrong. And you know that feeling. He says, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Dryness. What a difficult thing that is. Do your lips ever get dry and chapped and begin to break? You know, sometimes in the winter that'll happen to me. I suppose I'm supposed to put something on them to protect them, but they'll get dry and chapped and they begin to crack and they begin to break and that is miserable. Well, let me say to you, I've also come to those times when I was like that spiritually, even as I've been like that physically. I wanted to sing the praises of God, but my soul was dry and chapped with the winds of self-interest, with the winds of indifference. Not a pleasant place to be, but I am so thankful. I can, I can pause and think about the blessedness of being a child of God because when I am in a state like that, God does not leave me alone. He does not leave me there. He is going to put His hand heavy upon me that I might release everything I am, everything I am to Him. That I might know again the joy of being a child of God. That I might know again the blessedness of knowing my sin have been taken away. The blessedness of knowing that He's paid for everything and all is clean between me and Him. Let's go further. I want you to pause and think about the privilege of confession to God. Confession to God. Now, confession is something that is a very difficult thing. If we confess to another person, we're afraid that they're not going to forget what we have done. You know, they, we confess something to someone and then we see them again. They're thinking about what I told them about my shortcoming, about my sin. Now, confession to others may be a chore, but let me say to you that confession to God is a relief. Notice what he says in verse 5. He says, I acknowledged my sin to you. Now, God knows our sins. But we acknowledge it. We agree with Him and we're willing to see ourselves as He sees us. Now the joy of forgiveness is so great that we should do this readily. Every time that He shows us sin in our life, we should readily come to Him and say, Oh God, I'm sorry for that. I confess that to You. And He says, I forgive You. And He restores to us our joy. Notice what he says. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. Have you ever tried to hide your shortcomings? Have you ever blamed your failures on somebody else? Now, that's one way of doing it. You fall short. You fail. You say, well, even a saint of God couldn't live with him. Even the greatest, uh, even the apostle Paul would have difficulty with a neighbor like I have. We find ourselves trying to excuse our iniquity, trying to hide our iniquity. But friends, what we have to do is confess the guilt as well as the fact of sin. Confession does not blame sin on someone else, even on old Slewfoot the devil. You know, if you're blaming him for all your problems, don't blame it on him. Confession takes full blame on self. Nobody can make me sin. Nobody can get between me and my relationship with God. Nobody can cause me to do something that displeases my Lord. It is always something that I do myself. Verse 5 goes on and says, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Notice that he confessed his transgressions. To the Lord. It was not to men, but unto the Lord. We know that we're to confess our sins one another, one to another. That's what the Bible says in the book of James, especially when our sins have been against one another. But we must begin our confession with an acknowledgement that our sins are primarily against 
holy God. And notice what he says in the latter part of verse 5, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah, stop and think about that. A pardon of sin. Not forgotten by God, but not held against me. It is as though he takes it and just sets it aside and says, I'm not going to deal with that before you. Pause and think about the, the privilege of confession to God. And when he convinces you of sin, go to him and make it right before him. Let's go further. For I want you to see that we need to pause and think about the security of protection by God. Look at verse 6. He says, therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you, pray to God in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. And when he talks about a flood of great waters, know that the people of Israel were not a people of the sea. The thought of a flood or a shipwreck was terrifying to them. They were not those who'd want to who'd be buying the pleasure boats and going out into the middle of the ocean. Okay? They did not like the waters. They did not like the sea. He is saying this is protection from, not absolute freedom from, difficulty. There will be difficulties coming into our life. Have you experienced that? There's going to be difficulties come into our life. But He promises us protection from those things, not freedom from them. Those troubles will come, but they cannot reach us when we are resting secure in Christ, when we are resting secure on the solid rock. They can't harm us any more than the flood of Noah's day could reach Him because He was inside the ark. We have that relationship with Christ. In a flood of great waters, these things will not reach him. Verse 7 says, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. How much better it is to hide ourselves in the Lord than to hide ourselves from the Lord. The good news of our Lord's substitution for us makes him our refuge instead of our judge. You ever thought about that? He's our refuge. Whenever I fall short of God's glory, whenever I do something, I run, I run to Him, not away from Him. Okay? I run to Him, not away from Him. Satan wants you to do the other. You have failed God. He says, run, run away from God because God's displeased with you. So hide yourself from him. No, David said, I learned that's not the path because when you follow that path, you're going to feel like your bones are decaying within you. But he says, run to the Lord. Let him be your hiding place. Let him be your refuge. Trouble cannot do us any real harm. All trouble can do is drive us closer to our Lord. When a child is troubled, what does that child do? That child draws closer to mom, closer to dad, and that's exactly the picture for every one of us. That's the way it should be with each of us. He is our hiding place. He is our refuge. And then notice what he says in verse 7. You surround me with songs of deliverance. He didn't say, you surround me with fingers pointing in my face telling me how awful I am. You surround me with songs of deliverance. You bring a song back to my soul. As I said, David sinned in ways that none of us have ever sinned. Ways that would be terrible. Those that would be awful that you could not imagine being forgiven of such things. And yet he knew the forgiveness of God. He knew the pardon of God. He knew a relationship with God after he came back to God in repentance. It was marvelous. Spurgeon said this. Talking about the man in this psalm. Talking about David. It said, he says, the man is encircled in song. Surrounded by dancing mercies all of them proclaiming the triumphs of grace. There is no breach in the circle. It completely rings him round. On all sides he hears music. Before him hope sounds the cymbals, and behind him gratitude beats the timbrel. Right and left, above and beneath, the air resounds with joy. Stop and think about that. 
Stop and think about that. You see, this psalm talks about the pause that restores. Pause and think about the blessedness of being a child of God. Stop and think about the privilege of confession to God. Pause and think about the security of protection by God. And the song, songs of mercies will surround you because God is still on the throne. Now in the last part of this psalm, in verses 8 through 11, the Lord is now addressing David rather than David addressing the Lord or anyone else. The Lord is speaking to us instead of us speaking to Him. Listen to what it says in verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. You know what He promises us? Here David is, he's come to repentance. What does he promise him? What does he promise us? This is a promise of guidance. Once we are again in the fellowship of God, he promises to instruct us, to teach us how we are to go. Notice how he says that he will guide us. He says, with my eye upon you. To guide you with his eyes. To be guided like that, you have to have a close relationship with someone. This is what... This is how a wife sometimes speaks to her husband with her eyes. You know her pleasure. You know her displeasure. You know that she's telling you that you forgot to do something and she's reminding you, she's directing you with her eyes because you have such a close relationship, right? You know. It it goes the other way around. With a child and a mom or a dad, all you have to do if you're that parent is look at that child and that child, you can direct them with your eyes. They know when you're displeased. They know when you're dissatisfied. They know when they've messed up because they have a relationship with you, a close relationship with you. Well, if those illustrations don't touch you, then also it's the picture of a master with his favorite dog, okay? That you can just look at that dog and they know to get down off the couch. They know that they're doing something that they should not be doing because they know you. That's the relationship that God says that He has with us to where He guides us with His eyes. Whenever we know that we are displeasing the Lord, you know what He does? We don't have to have somebody else tell us. We may not even be able to quote chapter and verse of where that's wrong, but it's as though immediately we know that there's something that's not right here. And what that is, is God, through His Holy Spirit directing you, God with His eyes directing you. That says you've got to have a close relationship with God for that to be true. You've got to be looking to Him for that to be true. How can He guide us with His eyes if we have ourselves hidden from Him? It cannot be. You see, the sensitive man is going to look to God for leadership. But verse 9 is God's warning to stubborn men. It says in verse 9, Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. You see, if you are a Christian, yet not sensitive to God, He's going to deal with you as though you were a stubborn mule. All right? I've seen mules hollered at, pulled at, and kicked. Now, if you feel like that's the way God is dealing with you, here's your verse. Here's why. He wants to guide you with His eyes. But you need to know that whenever you are in rebellion against Him, He's going to put a bit and bridle in your mouth. He is going to pull on you, tug on you, push on you until He gets you back in the place where He wants you to be. Stubborn mule. I don't want to be that fact is we'd get into countless troubles if we were left on our own. I'm thankful He cares enough about me to come and fetch me home. Okay? Come and put that bit and bridle in my mouth and pull me back to Himself. And when I resist, it is to my loss, not to my praise. God uses whatever is necessary to keep us moving in a positive direction, even if it might be very slowly. So if you feel like you've been hollered at, pulled at, and kicked, stop acting like a mule and just put your eyes on the Lord and say, even so, Lord, you direct me, I will follow. Verse 10 says, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. 
The wicked are those who rebel against the Lord. The wicked will receive many sorrows and unhappiness. The trusting will be surrounded with great mercy. I am confident that you will know the mercies. God wants it to be so. He wants that relationship with you. He wants you to be to where that you keep your eyes on Him so that when He shows you some place in your life where you're falling short of His glory, when there's an attitude, an action, whatever it might be, to where that you are living in rebellion against holy God, He wants you to say, God, I didn't know. But I confess it, I see that it's wrong, that it dishonors you. And Lord, I surrender that to you. And you draw closer to the Lord and closer to the Lord and closer to the Lord. Satan's going to destroy you if he can. He's going to lie to you. He's going to tell you that you have to live perfect in order for God to love you that you have to somehow achieve, that you have to somehow measure up, or He is not going to have anything to do with you. Let me ask you by the testimony of David, is that true or is that a lie? So have you had sufficient time to pause and think about these things? The question is, how will you respond? The question is, what will you do? The question is, what do you need to surrender? What do you need to lay down? What has He said to you? Now is the time to respond to Him. I'm going to ask that you bow your heads, close your eyes, because God is the one who knows you. He knows everything you're dealing with. He knows all that you are and all that you've been. He knows what's going on in your life and the struggles that you're facing. He knows the joys that are there. And He knows the sorrows. What do you need to surrender to Him? How do you need to surrender to Him? All of this is predicated upon the idea that you have a relationship with God. All of this is about the fact of whether you've trusted Him as Lord and Savior. If you've not done that, then you need to face the fact that you need to, need to just surrender your life to Jesus as Lord. Because you're never going to have peace until you do that. You're going to have peace until you say, I know that I have sinned against holy God and I know that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins and so I put my hope in Him. I ask Him to be my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, please come into my life. And then you can have this type of relationship with God. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you need to get this right. If you've already done that, if you know that you are a child of God, but there's not peace in your life, ask Him to reveal to you that area of your life that you need to surrender Him. It may be just a matter of, of you trusting in self rather than trusting in Him. It may be just a matter of you listening to the wrong voice, of listening to Satan instead of listening to God. His Word should be washing over you. His Word should be making a difference in you. Now is the time. You just say, Lord, I don't want to be like that stubborn mule. Lord, I come to you and surrender everything I am to you. Let God speak to you now as we conclude this service. Let God speak to you over these next couple of minutes. If you need for me to pray with you, I'll be here at the front. But if you just, if you want to stay where you are, just talk to God. It's between you and Him. Just give Him that place in your life that He wants to have.